Today we're going to be learning Yvamot Daf Samachimel, a very interesting Daf, um, definitely a lot easier than our previous Daf Himel, although the content is, I should warn you a little bit about it. Um, more from a, a bit from a women's perspective, but I think that we, it's going to, we're going to talk about good wife, bad wife. Um, I think it's important to view this Daf in, uh, again, if we look in a historical context, the rabbis are speaking specifically to their crowd, which was a crowd of men. And if you take this, what we're going to learn about a good wife and a bad wife, and you flip it to the reverse, the same could be true for a good husband and a bad husband. So I think if we view it in that context, it'll it'll be a little different of a duff. Okay, this week's learning is sponsored for the Rafur Shlema of Hannah Bat Panina. And today's off is sponsored by Adina Gewurz in honor of her husband, Danny. He encouraged me to start that Yomi when we started the new cycle. Thank you for opening the world of Gemara to me. Okay, with that, we will start our daf. So we ended with this bright I'll start from the end of the bright tat. Remember, you should respect your wife, right? Someone who loves his wife because he loves himself or respects her more than he respects himself. Someone who puts his, right, gears his children in the right direction. And marries them when they're of marriageable age. Right? And that will be increased to your household. If you love your neighbors, you bring your, your relatives close to you. You marry your sister's, uh, your sister's daughter. Okay, Why your sister's daughter, not your brother's daughter? So first of all, some people say it means your sister or your brother's daughter. It could be both. Um, but Rashi says, Okay, and first of all, why specifically would you marry someone in your family? So the idea here is that if you marry someone in your family, you'll already feel this closeness to them. I think there was this concern that their spouses might not, you might not end up with such a strong relationship if you already come from a relationship, but have a connection to them already. Through the family, you'll feel this closeness to them and it will be a better relationship. So Rashi says that people feel closer to their sister than men feel closer to their sister than to their brother and therefore marry your sister's um, daughter and not the brother's daughter. But again, it doesn't necessarily need to be understood in that way. Okay, we're going to eventually get to, here's a passage that relates to all these things. If you loan money to a poor person when he is destitute. So first of all, we actually saw a statement earlier, I think it was in Chagiga, where it's not good to give money to someone when they're destitute because when they're in that struggle, people are always asking them for money. And if you give them money, you're basically just giving it right away to somebody else. So it's not always a good thing. And that's a bit of a question on this. Again, we've seen many times in the Gemara different approaches. Some people, because of that, explain this differently. Bishat Ko is not relating to the poor person when he's in time of need. It's you. You should lend someone money even when you don't have money, right? This is always an important statement that even if you're not wealthy, you still have to give charity. So you should lend money to someone. And by the way, this isn't even charity. This is loaning, which is right uh, even uh, considered a form of charity to lend money to someone when they need it, even considered a high form because you're not embarrassing them by saying, oh, here, you know, I know you need the money and don't bother giving it back. You know, but you're saying, okay, I respect you. I know you'll give it back to me eventually. So it could be when you're in a time of need, if you give money, that's a really great thing. Alava Kachuv Omeo about all these people that said, as tikrav Hashem yane, you will call out and God will answer. Tikashav ayomer hineni, you will call, cry out to God and he'll say, I'm here. Okay, this brings God closer to you. So we had the things that bring peace in your house and then we had the things that bring God, right? God will answer your prayers. Now we're going to have these seven statements of Rabbi Elazar. Some relate to advice about marriage. Some relate to financial advice. At a certain point today, we'll see the intersection of the financial and the good family and, you know, or the bad wife and the financial burden it could take upon you. But we're going to have some other things also besides these, but a lot of it is the rabbis giving all sorts of advice about women, about finances, etc. Siman, here's a siman to know what these seven statements are going to be about. Isha, women, karka, land. Um, Ezer, zot. Okay, these are just references to words we're going to talk about. Shte havrachot, tagare, and pachate. Okay, these are the things we're going to talk about. If you don't have a wife, you're not considered a person. Okay, this doesn't mean you're not considered a person. Obviously, you are, but the point is that you're missing something, right? This is very an important value. Shanaimah, where do we get it from? We're now in Brashi chapter five. 
where it kind of goes back because Adam's going to die, right? Ela told out Adam, and this is the right. Zachar and Kivab Abraham, they were created male and female. By Yikach Shmam Adam, and their names were called Adam, which is interesting in and of itself, right? Because Adam's name was Adam, not both of them. But here it says, right? They're called Adam. This means when there's a relationship, there's Adam. Not only if you don't have a wife, but if you don't have a land, okay, you don't own land, you're not a person. Again, this doesn't mean if you don't own land, you're a nobody. It just means that it's a good, I, this is the way the rabbi said it's a good, good advice, okay? Good advice that you should own land. Why? Right? Instead of explaining why, they basically bring a verse, right? That's the way they speak. The, the heavens are God's, the arts, that's how they did Adam, God gave man land. So that means you should own land, right? The real reason is not the pasuk, that's just how they get it. But the real reason is because we'll see this later, if you have land, you have, you always have something. You just always have cash on hand, your cash could disappear, but your land is always there. Okay, even though we'll see some negative things about land, but we'll, we'll talk about it. Amar HaBielazah, my dictive, if we go back to women, my dictive is selo ezer kinegdo. What does it mean? I will make for him help against him, right? We always struggle with this. What does it mean in Ezra Kinecto? This comes from the creation of, of uh, when, when Chava was created. Zacha, if he's worthy, Ozerto. Lo Zacha Kinecto. If he's worthy, she'll be with him, right? She'll help him. If he's not worthy, she'll be against him. Now, different ways to explain this worthy or not worthy, right? Worthy could mean if he's lucky, right? And he ends up with a good wife, she'll help him. If he ends up with a wife who's not so good, which we'll see all of this later in today's stuff, then he's not going to have, right? And she's going to go against him. In other words, a wife could be this or that. Or it could be if you're a worthy person, if he's worthy, then his wife will be there to help him, right? And this also, right, this is a good reflection. We all know that if you're, if one person doesn't act nicely to the other, well, the other responds in that way, right? And then you create antagonism in the relationship. This is within any relationship, whether marriage or anything else. So it could be if he's worthy, that will affect the way she treats him. Not necessarily, it has, right? So there's two ways to look at it. either. It's about him or it's about her, right? And about who's the one who's worthy or not worthy. Um, okay, obviously the Zachan, and Lozachah is relating to him, but it could be more like if you're lucky and you, know, you end up with a good wife or you end up with a bad one. Some people say that the way Rabbi Lazar said it was a little different, where he said like this, it's, there's a contradiction. He said, there's two different ways you can put the vowels in, right? The Torah, we all know, doesn't have vowels in it. The vowels are by tradition. Traditionally, it's read kinegdo, but it could be written, could be read as kinagdo, which nagdo, the nagdo is the guy who, who whips people with lashes. So, what do we say here? It's the same idea, but zachat kinegdo lo zachat minagadito. Okay, she'll beat him, right? This, to us in our more modern perspective, makes us think more of men who beat women, you know, and, and the opposite approach, right? But it's it's saying even for the man, that the wife could whip him with lashes if he's not worthy. Eshlechei Rabbi Yosef Leliyahu. Okay, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yossi Leliyahu. Rabbi Yossi Leliyahu appears to Rabbi Yossi. Amar Le. So Rabbi Yossi says to him, Ksiv selo ezer. Okay, if you had your chance to speak to Eliyahu, is this the first question you would ask? I'm not really sure. He asked the question, how does a wife help a husband? Okay, which is a bit of a strange question, but he doesn't see, right? <laughs> you would think it would be obvious, but you'll see based on some stories later, maybe you'll understand why maybe it wasn't obvious to him. But he asked the following question. How does, right? Now, some people explain that what he was trying to say is, is the idea, and this is why the sugi is here, is the idea of marriage only prove revu to have children or does she help him in ways other than just that? Okay, is she just there for that or there for other things? Now you would expect an answer, you know, he's, she's there for his emotional well-being, things like that. That's not what we're going to get here. Um, so what does he say? Amar lei, adam mevi chitim, chitim koses, pishtan, pishtan lovesh. You bring home the raw materials, but the wife turns those raw materials into something. You bring home the wheat, you worked in the land and you brought home the wheat, she turns it into food, right? You can't do anything with the wheat like that. You bring home the flax, she turns it into clothing, right? I, you, you, I assume some of you might be thinking about this. It sounds like Isha Chayo, right? The woman who's basically just working all the time, making food, making clothing, et cetera. Um, and then he says, right? Does she not lighten your eyes and stand you up on your feet? In other words, she's the woman behind the scenes doing all the stuff that you need. And without her, you'd be nothing. Now, 
There's different ways to understand this. Some of the rabbis take this to a place because first of all, he could do those things also. It's not like he's not capable of making flour and cooking food. And even in those days, I'm sure there were men who did that. But the point is that some of the rabbis take this, or some of the commentaries take it to a place where we're saying, and you're free to learn Torah. In other words, she works and that enables you to learn Torah, which is obviously, you know, what they view as very important. Um, it could be understood otherwise, you know, it could be understood, maybe it is emotional well-being, you know, and maybe it's couched in terminology that's, you know, very you know, practical, hands-on, but maybe it's saying, you know, you're, you're the raw material, but without her, right, you're nothing. And that's why I like his last line, which, which doesn't seem to, con- and it's, why do I think maybe it could be understood differently? Because it says she enlightens your eyes and stands you on your feet. Now, the clothing and the food doesn't exactly work with standing on your feet and, and enlightening your eye, you know, lightening up your eyes. So maybe it's saying there's something much more about beyond this. Okay. Maybe it is relating to emotional well-being and that, you know, couching it in terminology of, oh, look what she does. She processes things, but she processes, right? We all talk about processing and in communication. Anyway, there's a lot to be said for this. Right when when he ends up realizing you know the is for him right this time it's this worked for me so it sounds like something didn't work before he had relations with every other animal only then did it feel right now wait a minute we've been talking about bestiality and how terrible it is did he really engage with bestiality so. Right. This isn't meant to be understood literally. What it means is, or at least so I think, right? And so to other commentaries, but that the idea is that he tried to ha- engage in a relationship, you know, realize. And as the point is, it wasn't just, okay, man, woman, there was some sort of process that he went through to realize that she was the right thing for him. Okay, we're jumping around a little bit here. It's a bit of a jumpy duff. Um so it says by Abraham Avinu, right? God says, those who bless you will be blessed. Those who curse you will be cursed. And this is in uh, Bereshit chapter 12, verse three. And all the other nations of the, of the earth will be blessed through you. So what does that mean? Amar Kadosh Baruch Abraham. Now there's a bit of a strange language here. Nivrechu. It should be in Hebrew language. It should be yitbarchu, which means they will be blessed through you. Okay, but instead it says nivrechu. So nivrechu, the word lahavrich in Hebrew means to graft. So they understand this as a grafting. Okay, so what's the grafting here? Amar kadosh shtei I'm going to graft two good women into your, your people. Ruta amaha amuni. Ruta Moavia, we all know, right? And she brought about the birth of Tavida Melech. And Nama Amuni was married, was the... Um, woman who married one of the wives of Shlomo, who gave birth to Rahavam, who basically led to all the rest of the kings of Yehuda. So these two people, I'm going to instill in you, and they're going to bring about great people. What is this last part of the Pesach? Why the, the, I specifically translate it literally, right? Instead of saying all the nations of the world, it's all the families of the earth. What does that mean? So he says, even the lowly people who don't even have houses and live in the ground, right? Live like nomads. Those people, even them, are they, those people are going to be blessed by the Jews or on account of the Jews. So we're going to see the flip side. The Jews could also bring the destruction of other people. This is another pasuk that's promised in Bereshit Yudchet. You'll be a great nation. So what's Goyeha Aretz? Right, the nations of the land of the of the earth, even boats that go from Galia to Aspamia. In the Quran, they say this is modern day France and Spain, which are very far away from Israel. They are also blessed on account of the Jewish people. Okay, in the future, all the craftsmen are going to become workers of the land. Okay, now we're going to see in a minute, workers of the land is a bit of a curse. Like, it's not a great thing to be a worker of the land. It's a lowly job, right? If you're making gold or silver or things, that's a much more honorable job and much more financially stable job. So we're going to have to explain what this means, because usually we say in the future, we're talking about some glorious time in the future where everything will be great and people will do this. And instead, it's saying basically anyone who is a, a, a craftsman 
is going to kind of end up just working the land. People will come down from their boats. Right, all the people who are holding oars. All the sailors. They're going to end up on the land. Okay, which they explained to me, and they're going to end up working the land. This is a pasuk from Yechezka. Okay, Yardu means they're going down, down in a bad way. Like this is the lowest job there is, even though we've seen other places like the weavers was a very low job. But here he's saying working the land. Now it's very interesting because he said everyone should have land. On the other hand, he said working the land is a very is a very poor job. So now what does it mean everyone's going to end up working the land? First of all, it can be understood as well, we just said everyone should own land, so everyone will have land to work on, maybe. But other people explain it as people will be satisfied with very little, right? Where we all live in this world where everyone's chasing after money, right? And it will be the opposite. People will be very happy to just, right, as we call it Hebrew, to be happy with a little bit, and they'll all be fine working the land. And that's the bracha of the future. Something nice to think about. Okay, next. Rabbi Elazar Chazialahu Ara Deshadebe Krava Lefutia. And now we're going to get some financial advice. Okay, so he saw this uh, this field that was, they they did the plowing instead of lengthwise, which is the way to do it, they did it across the width, which wasn't so great. Amrle, he said to him, he said to the guy whose field it was, it seems like, he said, even if you put your furrows lengthwise, which is the right way to do it, much better to do business than to do this, okay? Go invest in something. That's a much more profitable business than working your field. Um, Rav, another very similar story. He walked in between the sheaves um, of wheat, I guess. He saw them swaying. He said to them, right? He was talking to them, it seems like. Great, you can sway, you know, all you want. But it's much better to do a business deal than to be you know, working the land. Amarava, mea zuze beiska, kol yom abisra vechama. You put a hundred zoos into some business deal, an investment, every day you'll eat meat and wine. Mea zuze ba'ara, but if you put that same hundred zoos into land, milcha vechapura, you're going to be eating salt and unripe produce. Okay, basically, again, I'm not going to say go out from this dock and go start investing your money and then claim, oh, I lost my money, but the Gemara told me I was going to gain money, right? Obviously, we know this isn't so simple. But what he's saying is better to invest in something than, than to work in land. Now, even though we said everyone should own land, right? But it seems to be that if you invest too much in land, right? First of all, we all know that land, you know, you could have a bad season. It's very iffy. Right. And what exactly it means by an ISCA, a business deal, we don't know exactly what that means either. Right. What is investing? Investing in what? It's not so clear here. Not only that, but if you basically work your land and that's all you do, you're going to end up lying down on the land, meaning you're going to have nowhere to sleep. You won't have a bed. You'll end up lying down there. Or you might have to be slave to your land and in order to protect it from people stealing things in the middle of the night, you're going to have no choice but to sleep there. Maybe you will have a house, but you'll have to sleep there. And Miramile Tigre, you're going to end up with fights with people. So now why are you going to end up with fights? First of all, we all know it's always hard to demarcate where's my property, where's your property, and you're going to get into fights like that maybe. Some people say you're going to not have a lot of money, which would then mean you don't have a house, you're going to end up sitting on the floor, and then you're going to get into fights with your wife because we all know that when there's financial troubles, right? Again, not to say if you don't have financial troubles, you don't fight with your wife, right? But again, there's often strife in the house when there's financial trouble. So that's another possible way to read it. Um, if we just take a step back for a minute, this is one of those Gemaras where we see the, this whole daf, where the rabbis saw themselves as wanting to give out all sorts of advice, not just halachic advice, but you know where to, how to invest your money, how to choose a good wife, how to, right? All these things, they, they saw themselves as everything people, right? Uh, we're giving you, this is a book that includes everything and here's a good proof of it. Okay, and again, it's not like this is halacha. This is not, right? You should just know, this is not meant to be halacha. You have to keep this exactly like you're supposed to keep other halacha, but right, this is meant to be um, advice, okay? And this is the rabbi sharing their advice with people. Amar Rappab, Zra Velotizbi. Okay, Rapapa, by the way, was wealthy, which is important. Okay, um, it's important to know in this context because again, it's easy to give 
to give out financial advice when you're in a financially good state. So he owned a brewery and he uh, he sold, you know, he he was very wealthy. So he says to people, you're better off planting your own fields. And even though we said planting fields is not for business purposes, but for yourself to eat, you should be self-sufficient rather than to buy your produce. Even if it costs you the same amount to grow it as it would to buy it in the store, better to grow your own produce because because the blessing will come to things that you plant and not to things that you buy in the store. Zabin below tizal, but buy stuff ready made and don't not food but products and don't weave them yourself. But okay, that you should buy it ready made. Okay, it's not exactly clear why he says this. But they say, but then they say, well, this is only things like mats or Rashi says it could be, we're talking about clay, buy it, okay, utensils for the house of a glima. But when it comes to clothing, you should do your own because you want it to fit properly, right? You go to the store, you buy like one size fits all, you know, it doesn't necessarily fit properly. So if you make your own clothing, then it will fit you right or it'll be tailored to what you need. Tum, okay, I hope no one's planning a, a big uh, renovation right now because you might not want to hear the next line. Tum velo tashpits. Okay, you should fill, if you have a hole, you should fill in your hole and don't start, pla- you know, so that you don't need a plaster. This is like a stitch in time saves nine, right? Fix your hole before it gets too big. Um, but if you can't, if it's too late, shpots, shpots really means to plaster it below tivne, but don't start breaking down your whole wall. Shakolo seik bibinyan mitmasken, okay? Once you start breaking down your walls, it gets very dangerous and you never know what's going to happen, right? It's, uh, anyone who does renovations knows the dangers of this, right? And that there's, as we say, ain't let our soap, right? It never ends, right? You you do that and then it causes that. And then, okay. Kfot zabin ara. Take any opportunity to buy land. It's a good thing. Miton nasib itita, but take your time when marrying a wife. Okay, here we see the connection of the two things we've been talking about, the importance of having land, the importance of having a wife, but one needs to be, right, thought out very well. One, okay, buy your land if you see an opportunity. Also, it might go up, someone else might buy it. But when it comes to a wife, take your time in choosing a wife. When it comes to choosing a wife, you can go down a level in terms of social status. Okay, don't you don't necessarily need to marry someone at your level, which either was a way to encourage them to marry women lower, or also some people say, if you marry someone in your social status, she's going to demand a lot from you and, and you might not live up to her expectations. But when it comes to a friend, you should go up a level to find a friend because you always, right, Javier Tov is, is going to influence you and you should go up a level to find a good friend. I, it's hard for me to understand exactly the difference here, why one go down a level and one go up a level. Uh, it's food for thought. Here's the, the flip of what we saw before. The good comes from the Jewish people. Also, the bad comes from us. Okay, we're responsible. When people get punished, we're also responsible for it. Because of the Jewish people. Okay, here we're quoting a pasuk from Tzfania. I'm destroying these, these, uh, these other nations. And then it says, Sorry, so then God said, but you should fear me and take Musal and basically improve your ways. And that's a result of, you know, they're saying that's what caused the other nations to suffer. Now we're going to hear some stories of people, rabbis who have wives who caused them a lot of strife. Rav HaMamiftar Mi Rabbi Chia. Okay, when he was departing from Rabbi Chia, Rabbi Chia said to him, He said, may God save you from something that's worse than death. Umi kamidi dekasha mimote. He started thinking to himself, "What could be worse than death? Right? Death seems pretty bad." Nafik dak veeshkach. He went out and he, he looked into it. and He found this pasuk that says, "Umose ani mar mimavet et haisha." This could be a pasuk we're going to see a lot today. Okay, it's a pasuk in Kohelet that says, "And I found something worse than death. Right? Something that's more bitter than death, and that's women. Okay, and that's the, you know the wife. Okay, so Rav have a kamitzari lelu debitu." happens, and maybe this is why Rav found this pasuk, is because his wife caused him a lot of strife. What was the strife she caused him? Well, he would say, please make me lentils. And she would make him, not sure what this is. Some people say it's peas. Some people say it's hummus. Okay, she would make him some other thing that wasn't lentils. When he asked for the chintze, she would make him tlofli. He got a Chia Bere, when Chia, their son, that's not the same as Rabbi Chia, who was talking before. Chia, his son, grew up, he, you know, saw the 
tension between his parents. And he said, I'll, I'll help resolve this, right? Like every good kid who wants to help resolve his parents' issues. So he says, okay, my, my father asked for lentils. I'll just tell my mother that he asked for chintze instead. So Amarle, so Rav sees this. He says, wow, yalach lach imach. He says to the son, wow, your mother's really changed, right? People can change. Look, she's switching it now. She's doing what I want. Amarle, so the son's a little too honest. And he says, anahu dekafich nale. It was me who flipped it. Marle, so he has two comments to his son. The first is positive, the second is negative. He says, The one who comes, this is what people, the quip that people say, what comes from you, meaning your children, can teach you often wisdom, right? So you've taught me wisdom because, right? Basically, I should have thought of this myself, right? It was obvious. If he's always getting the reverse, right? It's kind of like reverse psychology, right? So just say the opposite and then you'll get what you want. Uh, but then he says to him, you shouldn't do this. It's not a good thing to speak lies, untruths, right? Don't go to your mother and lying to her about what I said. That's not a good way to go. You, know, you have a lot to learn. Rabbi Chia, have a kamatsare le dubitu. Rabbi Chia also had a wife who was causing him trouble, which makes sense that he was the one who quoted the, right, who said to him, you know, this, you should be saved from the thing that's worse than death, which assuming, you know, that was it. So um, hold on for one second, because I see that you're asking a good question, which is, can't you lie for peace? So it's true you can lie for peace, but when it's his father and his son doing it, he wants his son to keep as far away from Shekhar as possible. You have to be careful because you'll learn from there to lie in other instances. So there's a fine balance to be found there. So now Rabbi Chia was basically had a wife who caused him a lot of trouble. However, it's the big word, however, when he would find something he knew his wife would like, it's very beautiful. He would wrap it up like wrapping paper, right? And he would give it to her as a gift, like not even just, oh, look, I bought this for you, but he would wrap it up nicely and give it to her nicely. So Amarle Rav, Rav, who was having issues with his wife as well, says to Rabbi Chia, but isn't she causing you all this trouble? Why are you going ahead and buying her gifts? Okay, we should look at, our wives, you know, at least they're doing two things for us, right? They're giving us children, right? They're, they're raising our children and they're saving us from sin, right? The idea of saving from sin, again, is this idea that maybe sits with us a little less well, but this idea that they have a wife at home, so they're not going out with other women, right? They don't have all these thoughts about other women because they have their wife at home. Okay. So it basically was trying to say, look on the bright side, look what, uh, you know, look what there is. Yes, I see you're saying how uh, Daf does Mother's Day. Yes, this is a good Mother's Day Daf, at least part of the Daf, I would say, not the entire Daf. You'll see, there is more positive coming up. Okay, so he taught his son the following pasuk, right? Great way to teach your child to have a good marriage, right? Just scare him into thinking, right, women are evil. Amarle Kigoman, so he said, oh, like me, what kind of woman is like this? He says to him, Kigon Imach, like your mother, okay? Interesting comment, but in another minute, we're going to see the opposite. He said, wait a minute, but isn't it true that he taught his son the following? Right, the, the place you're going to find solace in this world is from your first wife. Right, your 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 origins will be blessed, and you'll be happy with your wife of your youth. Vamrele kigoman. His wife said, "Like who?" And he said, "Kigoni mach, like your mother." So, how do we resolve this contradiction? On the one hand, he said, You're, "You know, my wife is your mother's crazy." You know, the bitterness of death. And on the other hand, he said, "You know, she makes me so happy." So Amara, so amat kif takifa vabure meabra bemila. She gets very angry easily, right? And very harsh, like she could be very strong and domineering. But when you talk to her, you know, it's easy to get her away from it, right? She gets into a mood, but you can sway her out of it and get out of it. And I think many people will relate to this notion of, you know, one day you might feel one way and the next day you might feel a different way, right? And that people have different moods and people are in different, uh, you know, and, and he could feel very strongly negatively about his wife on the one day and then another time feel very positively about her. So again, I'm going to go back because I said it in the beginning before you even knew what we were talking about, but I want to point out that I think all the things mentioned in this doc have to do with spouses in general. And it's all worded in the wife because first of all, the psukim relate to the wife, right? Again, when in those days, the center was 
you know, the, the male world was at the center. The women were in the home. They weren't learning. They weren't part of this whole, uh, they were obviously part of the world, but they were, and, and part of certain things. But the in general, the rabbis speak to the male audience for the most part. So, but I do think that the reverse of all these is true. In other words, this relates to any marriage and either side in the marriage. Um, okay, well, well, especially now as we see, hechidami ishara. So what does it mean to have a bad wife? What is a, a, a sign of a bad wife? She decks out your table very beautifully, right? She puts out food for you, but puma. But right, they're playing, making a plan. This for Makashta, but you know, she doles out the food, but she also doles out the criticism, right? And she's got a lot to say negatively about you, right? So again, you can view this wife saying about the husband or husband saying about the wife. Rav Amar Makashtale Tacha Mahadrale Gaba. She sets up the table very nicely and then she turns her back, meaning she's not interested in having anything to do with you, right? She's got her friends or her thing and she's got no interest in her husband. Okay, now we're going to start with some positive. Okay, once a man marries a wife, his sins disappear, right? They fall apart. Oh, here's the opposite of that pasuk, right? You find a wife, you find good. By the way, who wrote this pasuk? So this is a pasuk from Proverbs. And the other pasuk was from Kohelet, and both are attributed to Shlomo HaMelech, right? Shlomo in general and Kohelet, right, wrote all these contradictory things. And again, these don't necessarily have to be seen as contradictions, but, you know, as depending on who the person is, it could be bitter or depending on the moment, right? We all, you know, many of us, I assume, feel that way where, you know, one moment, and, you know, somebody, uh, Devar Steinmetz once wrote a great article about Dafiomi learning, and she said, it's a lot like a marriage and how, you know, one day, you know, you're going high and then another day you're having, you know, issues and it's not so simple. So in light of that, we can view, we can talk about that on today's stuff. It's good. Okay. So now, now why are Rabbanu Tavmit Pakikim? So first of all, they say, Masai Sham Satov, Vayafek Ratzom Hashem, and you'll get Ratzom from God. Okay. God will give you what you want. Okay. So this is obviously a very good thing. Um, so now, uh, right. Why are Rabbanu Tavmit Pakikim? So again, it could be because of the Hirvurim, you know, you were thinking of other women and now you have your wife. It could be also many people say, right, if he just found a good woman, you know, he, he'd go in the right direction, right? Often women can set people in the right, they could they can kind of uh, stabilize things in, in a person's life, okay? Likewise for a husband to a, to a wife. Okay, in Israel, when someone would get married, Amr lehachi, matza o motze. Someone get married and they say, well, what kind of wife did you find? The matza or the motze, right? One being the positive wife and one being the negative wife. If you're married to a bad woman, right, who's causing a lot of pain, it's a mitzvah to divorce her, right? You think, oh, you know, we're not so approving of divorce. No, it's not true, right? When you need to get divorced, you get divorced. Okay, if you, late is always like a negative term. If you divorce the late, then all the strife will leave. And everything will kind of calm down. Like the shame and the, um, will, will calm. But what if she has a large ketuba? Now you're stuck. If you divorce her, you're going to have to pay all this money that maybe you don't even have. So what do you do? Tsarata bitsida. You should, okay, now there's two ways to understand this. Either marry a second wife and that'll put her in her place and she'll start behaving better because, you know, competition. Or some people say that you should say, I'm going to go marry somebody else and that will whip her into shape. Just the fear that maybe you'll marry another wife will get her to behave better with you. Um, so the Amri Yinashi, as people say, this is another quick people say, with a friend and not with a with a thorn. Okay, so don't stick it to her, you know, but use someone else to get her to change her ways. Okay, having being married to a bad wife is like a, a, a terrible stormy day. Midyanim is a woman who causes you strife. Delef toreid b'yom sagrir means if you have a leak in your house on a terrible stormy day, you're stuck because you can't stay in and you can't go out. 
So that's like having, right, mishtava means it's compared to in Eshet Midyanim, a woman who causes you a lot of strife. You have nowhere to go. You're basically, right, this is anyone who feels like they're in a marriage where they're being abused. It's very, right, it's very suffocating. Let's see how great it is when you have a, a good wife and how terrible it is when you have a bad wife. So, okay, now there's two ways to understand this because either it's literally talking about a wife or it could be talking about Torah. And the Torah is compared to a wife. And maybe it means if you found Torah, you found good. So, they say either way you look at it, it shows how great it is to have a good wife. Why? If it's really talking about a good wife, then literally a wife, right? The, the Pasuk comes and says how great it is to have a great wife. That means it must be a really good thing. If it's talking about Torah, right? If we're going to compare Torah to a good wife, that shows how great a good wife is. And on the flip side, how bad it is to have a bad wife? Well, let's see. Right? It's worse than death. So, if it's talking about a bad wife, well, right? the, the Pasuk says how terrible it is. Right? The, the alternative is that it's talking about hell, how terrible hell is. It's worse than death. Well, then, that's the flip, right? If we're comparing hell to a bad wife, then you know how, must, how bad it must be to have a bad wife. He, I think what's great about this stuff, even if it's a little bit negative about the, the bad wife thing, again, I really think that this can be viewed in the flip as well. You know, a bad marriage in both perspectives from the man's side or from the woman's side. And it's relating to, right? Like you saw these rabbis who are struggling with their wives and it's, it's number one, real, right? It's very, very real. And you're hearing their struggles and they're relating to things that, that affect people that should be talked about that often people don't discuss, right? People look up on the outside, oh, everybody looks like they have a very happy marriage. And here they're getting into, you know, it's not so simple. And I think that's really uh, great that the Gemara is dealing with it, even if they deal with it in a way that we don't relate to as much, you know, in the way, and it's making it a little bit black and white. But again, the rabbis always talk in black and white. That's how they speak, right? They, they The Midrashim are all extreme and they want to get concepts out, even though it doesn't necessarily mean, right? Like Rav Yehuda was a great example where he talked about his wife in the extreme one way and he talked about his wife in the extreme the other way. He obviously didn't mean either of them entirely. Um, okay, next. We now have a pasuk. It's a pasuk from uh, Yirmiyahu. God is saying, I'm going to bring this terrible thing that you will not be able to get out of. So now we're going to have some drashot on that, some relating to our topic. What is an evil that you can't get out of? That's when you can't divorce her because it's too much money to divorce her. Okay, God has put me in the hands. This is an echa, right? God has put me in the hands of somewhere I can't get out of. Again, the same thing. Okay, there's different explanations given to this in Israel. They explain this pasuk. If your food is dependent on having cash on hand as opposed to owning land, again, the same issue. If you own land, you'll always have something to rely on. You have assets. If you have no assets, it's not so good. Okay, this is a pasuk from the, the curses in at the end of Sefer Dvarim. You're your sons and your daughters will be given to another nation. Now, we always understood this meant, right? You'll have another nation ruling you. But Amarav Hanan Barav, Amarav, Zo Esha Ta'av. This is when your father remarries and they have a stepmother. And that's like your sons and your daughters will be given over to some other nation, right? It's, and they'll be, you know, we all know that sometimes, right? Not always, obviously. There are some situations where that ends up being a very difficult situation. Begoin Naval Achisen. Now we're in Parshat Zinu, okay, with the... Uh, I will make them anger, I will in, in, cause them to be angered with a nation that's a naval. So what does this mean? Again, this is used to explain this bad wife situation where you can't get out of it. Right, most people change it to the minim, the heretics. How do we know this? Okay, this passage that says a naval said, Ein Elohim, that means a naval is someone who doesn't believe in God. But Manita Tana, in Bright, they say, Elohim she barbaria van she martanya, shemachim arumim bashuk. This is people who walk naked in the shuk. Some people say this doesn't mean start naked, it means they don't wear a lot of clothing. She'em lacham shukatsum to avatnam, akom yotermi mishma lech bashuk arom. Okay, someone who walks very scantily dressed in the shuk, that's 
you know, that's the most despicable, and that's what it's referring to. Rabbi Yochanan Amar Elu Chabarim. These are the Chabarim, which were known as the Zoroastrians, who became very strong in uh, in this time period of the of the Amoraim, specifically Rabbi Yochanan's time. Rabbi Yochanan atu Rabbi Yochanan was told that the Chabarim came to Babel. Remember, he was living in Israel, so he heard that they came to Babel. Shagan Afali, he shook and shuddered and fell off his seat. He was very upset because he knew that they were putting all these terrible decrees on the Jews. Don't worry, they take bribes. And if you bribe them, you know, the Jews will bribe him and then, them, and then they'll stop doing these terrible things. Okay, so he calmed down and he sat. What were the things that they gazrua? They decreed three things on account of three things the Jews weren't doing, right? Some people connect this to that the Zoroastrians didn't like the way the Jews were doing these things and, and punish them on account of it. Some people say, no, it was a, God decreed punishment because of three things the Jews were doing bad, and this, it came in the form of the Zoroastrians forbidding these three things. What were they? That they couldn't do shrita because of the matanot, because the Jews weren't doing matanot. They weren't giving the gifts to the coin they were supposed to be giving. Some people say they weren't doing it at all. Some people say they were um, they were going into business with Gentiles, which then exempted them from it. So they were doing it in a halachic way, but getting around it, which wasn't a good thing. Oh, they wouldn't let them go into the bathhouses because people weren't, either they weren't going to the mikveh at all, or maybe they weren't doing it in the way they should have been doing it. They would exhume the graves because the Jews were happy on their holidays. They celebrated the, uh, the Zoroastrian holidays or like, the Persian holidays. Um, so because of that, they were punished that they were assuming the graves. And what does this have to do with Midah, Kenega, Midah? This one, not as clear. Some people say because they were worshiping idols and idols are like dead people. So they were basically punished through their dead. Now we're going to talk a little bit about exhuming the graves. The hand of God will be on you and your fathers, meaning how your fathers, your fathers are dead. Oh, by taking them out of their graves. This is taking people out of their graves. Okay, because of the sins of the lot, the lot living people, the dead people get taken out of their graves. Okay, one pasuk says this is in uh, Yirmiyahu. They're going to be, they're going to be. Uh, collected and not buried, okay? These people won't find burial. And the next pasuk says, people will prefer death than life. This is a little bit strange. Why would you prefer death than life if you're not even going to get buried? So I'm right It's not that people choose death over life. It's that God chooses to kill the rishaim before they get too bad and end up again to save them from sinning. Now, we're going to have a whole bunch of quotes from Sefer Ben Sira. Okay, ben Sira was one of the books of wisdom, it's called, and it was written after the canonization of the Torah. So kind of in between the end of the second temple period, the end of the, um, sorry, the end of the first temple period and the Cheshmona Imrul. It was this book that was written that the rabbis often quote from, even though it wasn't put in the Torah, the Gemara often quotes from there. Kachup is Sefer Ben Sira. Isha tova matana tova a good wife is like a good gift to her husband. Uchtiv tova b'chek yirei Elohim tinaten. A good wife will be given in the bosom of someone who's a God-fearing man. Isha ra'a tzara l'ba'ala. But if you have a bad wife, it's like leprosy, okay? Some people explain leprosy distances other people from you, right? If you end up in a bad marriage, right, it often other people don't want to be with you, right? Because if someone, if one spouse is behaving horribly, right, people just don't want to have much to do with them. Some people say it's also, you know, you want to get as far away from it as possible. What can you do? Okay, divorce her and then you'll be healed from your leprosy. Isha yafa ashre ba'ala, a beautiful wife, her husband will be happy, his, her husband will be happy, his days will be doubled, either maybe he'll just feel like you know, he'll enjoy every day more. Watch your eyes from looking at some be- other beautiful women. Maybe you'll be entrapped by her trap. Don't go hanging at her husband's house to hang out and drink wine with him because you'll end up seeing his wife a lot. Because around the presence of beautiful women, many people have been destroyed. The amount of people she can kill are many. Okay, this is talking about the dangers of, right, being seduced by a woman. The people who are rochlim, they go to house to house, 
selling things. They're always the ones who end up in the houses with the women when people aren't home. Hamargilim lidvar veira, they end up, lidvar erva, they're ending up doing a lot of erva things. Kenitzot mavir gachelet. Like these things happen very quickly. It's like a fire. You know, it catches fire and then spreads. Kikluv malay of, it's like a, like a cage full of birds, okay, that it's full of bad things. Kemba tehemalei in mirma. Okay, their houses are full of uh, evil things. Al tatsir tzarat machal kilo tedam mayele yom. Totally different type of advice. Don't worry about tomorrow. Okay, don't be this big warrior. What's going to happen tomorrow? What if blah, 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 blah. Ve, because why? Kilote da my lady You don't know what's going to happen. Shema machar bave nenu. Maybe what you're worried is going to happen tomorrow won't really happen. You're ending up worrying about something that's not even yours. Don't have a lot of people coming to your house. Don't bring everything home. Right? This is also maybe fear that you'll bring a woman home and something will happen. You should have a lot of allies, a lot of people who are your friends, but but only tell secrets to one in a thousand, right? It's very dangerous. And the most people don't know how to keep secrets. Okay. That's the end of that section. Now we're going to get into a few statements and we'll end with this quickly about the importance of Piriyah Rivya that we've been talking about having children. This we already saw. Right, the Mashiach is going to come when all the neshamot have been put into all the bodies. Right, God made these neshamot, and once they're done, then I will come out. Tanya, Rabbi Leizer Omer, Kom she'ein osek b'priyah ruyak ilu shafech damin. It's like you're a murderer. Shne'emar, shafech dam adam ba'adam damo yishafech uchzi batreva atem puruvu. This is what we call smichu prashio. Right, this is obviously if you can have children and don't have children, right, it's as if you're, by not bringing people into the world, it's almost as if you're killing people, right? It's obviously not the same, but they're saying it's very important. Rabbi Yaakov Omer, ki ilu me'me'et ha'dmut. It's like you're making the demut of God lesser in the world. Shinemar ki b'tzelem elohim asata adam, muchti batreya tempu revu, because it says man was created in God's image. And then it says, and you should have children, you should create more of the image of God, and you're basically limiting. Ben Azayomer, here's the most interesting thing, I think, of today's stuff. If you, other things weren't interesting here, we have a really interesting thing I'm going to leave you to think about. Ben Azayomer, ki ilu shofech tamim umme'et ha'dmut. He says it's both those things. Because it's next to both. They said to him, There's people who give good drush out and they, they keep them. They have good, right? They, they do the Torah, but they don't really know how to give drush out. But you have this beautiful drush out, but you don't do it. Because I see someone's writing in the chat, right? You never got married. So how could you say this is, right? You're doing terrible things if you're not doing this and you yourself didn't get married. Amar lehem ben Azai, and you can tell me whether you accept this or not, and whether the rabbis accepted it or not, it's not clear. They were clearly critical of him in the beginning. He said, A very powerful statement. He says, look, my heart is in the Torah, and other people can do that. Okay? And I don't need to do that because other people could do it. A bit of a dangerous statement. Um, and what does it mean, Some people say, it obviously means, right, I, my heart is to Torah, I should, I should spend all my days doing that. Some people say that what he meant was, I don't have any passion for women. In other words, my passion is for Torah. So I don't have any passion left for women, and therefore I'm going to keep in this way of Torah, which is an interesting interpretation. Anyway, they're clearly critical of him. The, the Gemara brings another bright to Tanya Edaf with the exact same thing, except a change of one name. Right, the first one, it's like you're a murderer. Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, this is switched with the person who said it before. And then Ben Azai Omer, they don't even tell you the whole thing he said. And Amrula the Ben Azai Yeshna Adolesh. So it's another bright that basically has the same idea. Question is, was Ben Azai right or wrong? Maybe we'll start tomorrow with the Rambam who has a comment to say about this. Have a great day, everybody. A lot of food for thought.